Welcome to the online module for Crossover Youth. This module will discuss the implications for research and practice regarding crossover youth based on previous empirical research. Our project team at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work includes Minei Cho and Wendy Haight, Professor and Gabos Cagmo Chair. We are grateful for the financial support of the Gambles Cagmo Endowment and federal Title IV-E funding through the Minnesota Department of Human Services and the Center of Advanced Studies in Child Welfare. In this module, we are going to introduce a longitudinal study of crossover youth, its purpose and results. Based on the study findings, we will discuss implications for interventions with a focus on prevention. We will also talk about directions for future research. Crossover youth. Crossover youth are broadly defined as youth who have experienced some forms of maltreatment, including abuse, neglect, and have engaged in delinquency. They can become first involved either in child welfare system or the juvenile justice system, but in 90% of the crossover youth cases, youth first show up in the child welfare system and then cross over into the juvenile justice system. Empirical studies consistently support that maltreatment places youth at greater risk of involvement in the juvenile justice system. Such involvement further compound risks of already vulnerable youth. Early involvement in the juvenile justice system. In addition, maltreatment youth become involved in the juvenile justice system at younger ages than their counterparts who have no maltreatment histories, that is, delinquency only youth. For example, in 10 California counties, 29% of maltreated youth, but only 90% of delinquency only youth, entered the juvenile justice system before age 14. In Arizona, crossover youth experience probation first delinquency petition and first time detention at younger ages than their delinquency only counterparts. Early involvement in juvenile justice system. A considerable body of research in criminology and psychology has identified two distinct trajectories of antisocial behavior. First, the relatively early onset of delinquency before age 14 is predictive of serious and continuing offending by age 18. In other words, youth who commit delinquency behaviors at younger ages tend to commit more and more serious subsequent offenses over a longer period of time than do those youth who first engage in delinquency at later ages. Second, later onset of delinquency is associated with distance from adult crime. Delinquent careers in this group are relatively brief. Youth who commit delinquent behaviors at later ages mostly desist from subsequent delinquency by adulthood. Thus, maltreated youth who tend to become involved in delinquency at early ages than their delinquency only counterpart may be more likely as a group to show continuing offending. Indeed, crossover youth have higher recidivism rates than delinquent youth who are not maltreated. For example, the rate of subsequent arrest was 72% for crossover youth and 61% for delinquent-only youth. Among first and violent juvenile offenders, youth with open child welfare cases were 1.36 times more likely to recidivate than those who were not under the supervision of the child welfare system at the time of arrest. Purpose of this research. Existing research consistently indicates that the early onset of delinquency results in more negative developmental outcomes than the later onset of delinquency. Understanding risk factors associated with the early onset of delinquency is foundational for designing effective preventive interventions targeted to risk factors for continuing delinquent and or adult criminal behaviors. This study explores risk factors associated with the early onset of delinquency for maltreated youth in Minnesota. Research methods. This study used an explanatory sequential mixed methods design in which a quantitative data analysis is followed by qualitative data collection and analysis. The quantitative data is used to examine delinquency rates and risk factors of early involvement in the juvenile justice system for maltreated youth. The qualitative data is used to explore the perspectives and experiences of professionals who are currently working with crossover youth. The goal was to increase our understanding of the results from the quantitative study by providing a more contextualized description of crossover youth. 
For the quantitative study, we obtained administrative data from Minnesota Department of Education, Human Services, and Judicial Branch. We identified 5,002 maltreated youth in third grade in the 2008-2009 academic year. Using a prospective longitudinal design, we tracked maltreated youth over six years from third grade to eighth grade to examine their first involvement in the juvenile justice system. The main analysis of this study examined risk factors associated with early onset of delinquency for maltreated youth using the Cox Proportional Hazard Regression Model. For the qualitative study, we interviewed 21 professionals with a variety of roles in child welfare and the juvenile justice, including child protection investigators, case management workers, probation officers, county attorneys, and judges. The interviews explored professionals' experiences with crossover youth and interpretations of risk factors for crossing over among maltreated youth that we identified in the quantitative study. All individual interviews were transcribed verbatim. Using analytic induction techniques, the interview data was analyzed to understand professionals' interpretations and meanings through multiple readings of the transcription. In this module, we will present a part of the qualitative results. We will provide detailed quotes from the interviews related to risk factors for crossing over so as to contextualize the quantitative study results. This table shows study sample characteristics. I am going to highlight some of the unique characteristics of this study sample. Approximately half of the youth were male. They were primarily white, but youth of color are disproportionately represented. For example, the proportion of Native American crossover youth was approximately 7% compared to 2% of all Minnesota public school students. The proportion of black crossover youth was approximately 23% in contrast to only 11% of all Minnesota public school students. Youth with disabilities also were disproportionately represented. 20% of crossover youth had individualized education plans, IEPs, compared to 15% of all Minnesota public school students. Compared to 38% of all Minnesota public school students, the large majority of youth, 71%, were from low-income families. 60% of the maltreated youth were attending school at rates similar to others in the state public schools, which means the state average attendance rate. The state average attendance rate was 94.8% of school days. As a group, maltreated youth met or partially met state competency standards in reading and math. Despite only being in elementary or middle school, some maltreated youth had already experienced out-of-school suspensions before they crossed over. The mean age at the first incident of maltreatment was three and a half, standard deviation 2.4. However, the actual mean age at the first incident of maltreatment likely is lower. The administrative record for maltreatment only went back to calendar year 2000, so we were not able to identify any maltreatment and out-of-home placements that occurred during the first or second year of life. Approximately a fifth of youth had more than three child maltreatment reports and approximately 10% of the youth had experienced out-of-home placements by third grade. This is a visual representation of the timing of youth's first adjudications. Over the six-year study period, approximately 7% of the youth, 332, crossed over to the juvenile justice system for the first time. Not surprisingly, the pattern is relatively flat until sixth grade, when there is a steady increase through the remaining study period. The mean age of the first adjudication for those youth was 12.5. Standard deviation, 1.16. This table shows the results from the Cox regression analysis. A value greater than one in the hazard ratio indicates a greater likelihood of involvement in the juvenile justice system by the end of the observation date. First, male gender was associated with a higher hazard. Boys were more likely than girls to cross over with a 54% increase in the hazard ratio for maltreated youth. Out-of-school suspension also was related to a higher hazard. Youth who experienced out-of-school suspensions were more likely to engage in delinquency with a 53% increase in the hazard for maltreated youth. The effects of race, emotional or behavioral disorders, and more than three maltreatment incidents were found to be associated with the risk of early involvement in delinquency among maltreated youth. Compared to white youth, Black, Hispanic, and Native American youth were more likely to cross over with an 81%, 73%, and 134% increase in the hazard, respectively. 
Youth with emotional or behavioral disabilities were nearly two times more likely to cross over than those who did not have those disabilities. Youth with more than three maltreatment incidents were two times more likely to cross over than those who had less than three maltreatment incidents. This study found that maltreated boys were significantly more likely than maltreated girls to engage in delinquency. This finding is consistent with existing research that indicates an increased risk for males involvement in the juvenile justice system. The higher male crime rate is often attributed to both genetic and gender role socialization vulnerabilities. Boys are taught to be tough and physical, while girls are more self-controlled and submissive. Gender role socialization may be reinforced in the school environment and the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Such socialization may be conductive to externalizing behaviors and confirm adult expectations of delinquents. On the other hand, girls are more likely to receive attention from professionals, which may operate as a protective factor for early delinquency. For example, mandatory reports show higher responsiveness of reporting for girls because they perceive them to be more vulnerable than boys. Overall, girls are more likely to receive attention from professionals in the system. In a qualitative interview of this study, a juvenile court judge described the role of gender socialization and school expectation in the increasing risk of delinquency for males. Quote, We think boys are more aggressive and loud, and they probably are for cultural reasons. And so when we see boys engaging in things, our mind assumes and goes to the law-breaking explanation in a way that maybe we don't do with girls, right? And then I think socialization, societal messages about what it is to be a boy and how it is to act like a man. And then that gets reinforced by societal expectations on how boys act. End of quote. In this study, compared to white youth, black, Hispanic, and Native American youth were more likely to cross over with an 80%, 73%, and 134% increase in the hazard, respectively. A child protection investigator who identified himself as an ethnic minority demonstrated some challenges to work with families from different cultural backgrounds. Quote, It's a challenge to explain to my co-worker what it's like. When I get a case where the family is from a culturally different background or mostly Asian culture, I understand where they're coming from. When I go back to explain to my supervisor why they did this or that, it's, a, it's very hard. My supervisor is Caucasian. Then if we involve the court, I have to explain it to the county attorney, and then I have to explain it to different parties. But when I go to court, I don't get a say. I cannot give a voice. End of quote. Out-of-school suspension also was related to a higher hazard of first-time adjudication. Youth who experienced out-of-school suspensions experienced a 53% increase in hazard for first-time adjudications. A child protection services case manager in a qualitative interview described the negative effect of out-of-school suspension for, maltre for maltreated children. Quote, the kids are so sweet. Overall, I think they were good. The oldest one, a 14-year-old, they said that overall he was good, but one time he was pushed to the point where he got in a really bad argument at school and was suspended for a few days. But you see in the kids who are suspended, they're always angry. I think that they act out. When you're talking about how they are kicked out, suspended, and their boys, that's what we see. End of quote. Results from the quantitative study indicate that emotional or behavioral disorders also increase the risk for first-time adjudication by 96%. A qualitative interview with Child Protection Supervisor supports such findings. Quote, from the cases that I have seen, it's really understanding the individual's needs versus labeling and I think that there is a lot of labeling, whether it's ADD, ADHD, conduct disorder, those kinds of things. You're quick to do that. Instead of looking at whatever trauma the child may have experienced, and with this age, especially this early age, you're still learning to put words to their emotions from what they may have observed or seen. In the families we work with, they may have seen domestic violence or chemical dependency. It's the environment that they have grown up with, so they are kind of reacting in a way that is normal what appears to be normal, not necessarily healthy. I think that in this society, we're quick to label to say that they have emotional or behavioral issues. But in fact, they're just dealing with particular tra trauma. We need to be more proactive and apply resources to address that trauma, because this could possibly be temporary. End of quote. 
More than three previous official records of maltreatment were associated with a 102% increase in risk of first-time adjudication. There are a variety of reasons why this may be the case. Children who are neglected may not understand or be motivated to engage in positive relationships with adults. Children who are abused may learn that aggressive or disrespectful behavior is an appropriate social response, including to conflict. Difficulties in forming relationships with adults can result in problematic behaviors and increased risk for delinquency. For example, aggressive or disrespectful behaviors at school that result in out-of-school suspensions. Implications The findings of the current study also demand further investigation. This study found that maltreated youth who crossed over by early adolescence were involved with the juvenile justice system for the first time at an average age of 12 and a half. In other words, some become involved in the juvenile justice system at an even younger age than the age of 14, which is used as an indicator of early onset delinquency in the literature. Future research needs to consider the trajectories of these very young offenders. For example, do maltreated youth engage in delinquency before age 12 and a half are at a heightened risk for more serious continuous offending behaviors? Future research also needs to compare the criminal trajectories in maltreated youth who engage in delinquency at different periods of development, as well as protective factors that interrupt the trajectories for the design of preventive interventions for maltreated youth. Implications for practice. Crossover youth are of particular concern to child welfare, juvenile justice, and other professions because of the risk of problematic developmental outcomes. Interventions should be preventive to alter the negative developmental trajectories of maltreated youth. A growing body of research has identified potential risk and protective factors for maltreated youth crossing over into delinquency. The integra integration of research results into the interventions can lead to effective strategies and strengthening positive outcomes of the interventions. It also clearly requires interventions that simultaneously address risk and protective processes across multiple ecological levels and development. Such interventions also should be individualized and non-stigmatizing. Maltreated youth are a diverse group of individuals with varying strengths, challenges, interests, and preventive interventions should be appropriately tailored. A mentoring program may be one of the individualized, non-stigmatizing approaches to preventive interventions with maltreated youth at risk of delinquency. There is a considerably, considerable body of research describing the characteristics of effective and ineffective mentoring relationships and programs. Such information can provide guidance for designing effective mentoring programs for maltreated youth. Mentors from youth's existing social networks, including extended family members or neighbors, are more likely to remain connected with them longer than formal mentorship programs. Also, having autonomy in the process of choosing a mentor can lead to positive youth's attitude towards the mentoring relationship. A large-scale mixed methods evaluation research compared youth's outcomes for 722 youth in a natural mentoring program and 451 youth in a control group. In a large-scale mixed methods evaluation study of a natural mentoring program, dropout or expelled youth aged between 16 and 18 showed significantly improved youth outcomes at the 21-month follow-up compared to the control group on all outcomes, including high school diploma, college credit, employment, and convictions. In this study, youth who identified mentors on their own were more likely to be in enduring relationships than those who received help choosing their mentors from parents or staff. 74% of youth in natural mentorship reported contact with their mentor at the 21th month follow-up, compared to less than half of relationships for youth in traditional mentorship. Results also indicated that when mentors and mentees were of the same race, they tended to be in longer-lasting relationships. Previous research indicated that difficulty bridging cultural differences can be a cause for early termination of relationship. Youth participants described how mentors supported their positive development in general. Among youth in long-lasting mentoring relationships, three major themes emerged related to the types of support they received. Mentors provided valuable social-emotional support, guidance, and instrumental support. Those supports contributed to improvement in youth's educational and occupation success, relationships, and self-concept.
Consistent with the previous studies, most professionals in the qualitative study describe the mentorship program as one of the most important services to prevent maltreated youth from becoming delinquents. A child protection worker in ICSW described the mechanisms through which the mentoring relationship fostered positive youth outcomes. Quote, I think another protective factor, specifically for the native kids and teenagers, is other tribal members as a mentor, just reconnecting to their culture and spirituality. Tribal members are huge because they understand, and they are one huge umbrella of family. Currently, I am working with a native teenager. I've been trying to connect him with the tribe where he's enrolled. When he was there and placed there, he loved it. He thrived. He was involved with a cultural, spiritual peace. He had mentors because they were was older male figures who can talk how should a young man grow to be a good man and he thrived. Conclusion Maltreated youth are usually involved in multiple systems including child welfare, juvenile justice, special education and mental health. Some promising interventions may reduce the extent of their involvement into the juvenile system. However, there are few interventions that prevent maltreated youth's initial involvement in the juvenile justice system solution to crossing over require cross-system collaboration and individualized and non-stigmatizing interventions. Thank you.